My name is Jim Tuckwell. I was a private with the 1st Battalion of the Dorsetshire Regiment. Uh, we had been fighting in Sicily and Italy when we were brought back to do the D-Day landings. We landed on Gold Beach at 7.25 in the morning. At 7.26 I got hit through the arm. Later I got hit through the chest. But I didn't get picked up until 5 o'clock in the evening. You might get hit on your right or left and your instinct is to help him. But we weren't allowed to do that, we had to carry on. Because when the tanks came ashore, they don't know whether you're dead or alive. And the tank has got to get off the beach because he's a sitting target. Uh, so he probably would run over you, you know. It's a hard thing to do, but uh, survival, you do things that you wouldn't normally do. War has both interested me and confused me. It has been glorified and demonized. It has made heroes of some and victims of more. What I have learned about war, I have learned from history class, from documentaries, and from books. It has been about strategy, about weapons, and the numbers of lives lost. But now, as I set forth on a journey through World War II cemeteries and battlefields in Europe, writing and recording music as I go, I hope I will experience the war in a very different way. My name is David Porches, and this is War Music. I have been playing and writing music for the greater part of my life. It is the way that I express myself and convey my experiences. A few years ago, while on tour with singer-songwriter Simeon Ross, I met his grandfather, Bill Ross. Bill Ross was a World War II veteran who shared many of his stories with me. He helped inspire me, at the age of 22, to leave Canada and embark on this journey. On an early morning on June 6, 1944, soldiers boarded a ship that would take them across the English Channel. Imagine, D-Day. Hundreds of boats and planes converging. Over 130,000 Allied troops amassing for the largest single-day invasion of all time. How lonely and frightening it must have been for a soldier, knowing that in just a few hours, the sounds of gunfire and bombs would be replacing this peaceful silence. I'm in Bayou, in France. Um, I arrived here about an hour and a half ago. But I, I can't even I, I can't even explain to you where I am. Um, I'll show you instead. take you days to go and look at every single grave literally because you can't you can't just look at it for a second and think oh okay that's another one you stare at them 
and disbelief that this could have happened, but it did. See, I'm in one of the uh, bunkers now, point the hook. Uh, there's quite the smell down here. It is so quiet in here compared to outside. You know, considering all of the uh, the wind and stuff, it's just, it's almost peaceful in here. It's damp, dark, and uh, I couldn't imagine living in this thing, uh, especially under the threat of attack. I have no idea how they, how they survived this mentally. And the uh, zoom? Ah, uh, oui. Uh, easy. Ah, oh, okay. If you uh, hold... Oh, yeah. <laughs> Unless you want to zoom, yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's okay. C'est bon? C'est bon. C'est tellement. <laughs> David in Normandy. <laughs> 40 ans. David in 40 ans. David walk on the street in 40 ans. <laughs> so how was your filming experience? Oh, very good. Very, very good. good? Yes, yes. Yes. I'm very keen on <laughs> crazy filming. about it. Yeah. I think uh, I be, uh, I'm I'm becoming a, a very good filmmaker. I yes. think so as well. Yes. While doing research for my journey, I met Marie. She gave me valuable information on places I could visit in northern France. She was kind enough to travel with me to Carentan, a small town in France that was liberated by the Americans. I had only corresponded with Marie by email, so this is the first time we are meeting in person. By chance, we run into John, an American exchange student who I met the night before at my hostel. Of course he can speak fluent French, and I'll be honest, I'm jealous. You don't like the appearance of the Americans money? <laughs> don't give uh, enough money <laughs> to their monuments. Uh, who? Are the Americans? <laughs> because it's for Americans. Uh, so, you know, so Americans don't give uh, enough money to have uh, better monuments. <laughs> well, whoever built it thought it was good. Marie's family has invited John and I to stay over with them. How could we say no? have lived in this house since before the Second World War. Her family even hid German and Polish soldiers who did not want to fight in the war. Marie's father, to this day, keeps in contact with one of those soldiers.
Li's family has offered to introduce me to some people in their town who will share their World War II experiences with me. Mr. and Mrs. Bredon shared the story of Major Edward Greg Steef. Major Steef was a Canadian soldier who died during the war liberating Marie's town. Mr. Levigneur was the man who found Major Steve's temporary grave and had it moved to the place where it lies today. When he became mayor, he had the street named after Major Steve. Nul ne pourra jamais trouver, j'espère pour eux, la joie de la libération. C'est une chose formidable. Ouais, 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 ouais. Quand on découvre que d'un seul coup on est libre, ouais. on va pouvoir aller où on veut, on va pouvoir acheter ce qu'on veut, quand, quand on aura de l'argent et quand il y aura ouais, un ticket. Ouais, 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 ouais. Mais enfin, disons que le sentiment de la liberté recouvrée, c'est une chose extraordinaire. Ouais, ouais. C'est indescriptible, ça. C'est ouais. un petit peu comme le gars qui est prisonnier. May and I'm trying to see the reason for choosing me. Though I think I'm scared I know you're there Look, I It's very strange seeing your family name on a headstone Come closer to me Look, I feel John has to head to Paris So we take him to the train station I have to leave within the day as well but I'm not sure I'm ready to do that yet. But I'm trying all I can to make things right. Love I feel. Gotta keep another sin I say. I'd say leaving like a friend so hard. For Canadians, Dieppe is a very sore memory. 
Over 5,000 Canadian and British troops stormed this beach on August 19, 1942. The Canadian troops taking part in this invasion had been inactive for nearly two years while stationed in Great Britain and were eager to see battle. 900 Canadian soldiers died during this attack and over 3,000 casualties in total were sustained. Although the operation failed, what was learned from these heavy losses was used to help win the battle at Juneau Beach nearly two years later. On the 10th of June, 1944, the German 2nd SS Panzer Division killed over 600 men, women, and children. They all lived in the town of orador sur -Glan. The Germans completely destroyed the town, taking their time, destroying it building by building. Of the entire town's population, only a handful survived. The original tram tracks can still be seen, and the cars that were burned that day remain. Those who were murdered lie in the cemetery. Entire families were wiped out. It's quite incredible how it looks. <laughs> incredible in the... Uh, uh, scariest of senses. I set aside a couple of days in Paris, just to be a regular tourist for a while. While checking out the sites, I meet a few people who invite me out for a night on the town. Quand on est belle, on doit supporter tous les gens qui nous prennent pour des objets. Quand on est bonne, on a à lutter. Don't get me wrong, it's absolutely beautiful, but for fuck's sake, the noise. The tourists. Just incessant. Not the same thing as I was I was in Paris, a city where millions of tourists flocked to enjoy the culture, the food, and the wine. And all I wanted to do was get back to the journey. I arrive in Bastogne, Belgium. I take a short taxi ride to the outskirts of the Ardennes forest. I enter the forest, and it feels like I'm walking into history. The American and German armies fought on this land. In the bitter cold, the Americans were outnumbered three to one, and without proper winter clothing, little ammunition, and barely any food, the Americans pushed forward. Despite the odds, the Americans held out and eventually forced the Germans back. The holes from the war still remain. While setting up my gear in a World War II foxhole, I hear one of the loudest sounds I've ever heard. I never found out what that sound was, but it did help inspire the next song I wanted to write. It's a song from the perspective of a soldier who would have fought on this land Get back and defend 
friend, my friend, you're on the road to the end. Get back and choose who you fight. There's not enough for everyone to keep alive. I hide. In an effort to regain territory captured by the Germans, Allied forces initiated the largest airborne attack of all time. The British 1st Airborne Division was to capture this bridge in Arnhem, but it proved too difficult. Because of this, Allied troops could not progress past the German defense lines, and thousands of soldiers and civilians lost their lives during the harsh winter that followed. Why exactly are you guys here? Right. Well, we're taking part in the uh, IMM, uh, military skills uh, competitions for the reservist uh, forces. Uh, obviously, we're attached to the uh, Royal Auxiliary Air Force. What do you guys think when you see, you know, all of this? Um, I don't know, you can go first. Um, I think it makes you appreciate, doesn't it, the, uh, the loss? Being part of the forces, you know, you, 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 know, you understand, and it's like, um, Treading in someone's uh, footsteps, in, 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 you know, in some respect. If you see the uh, the, the average age, uh, very <laughs> yeah, young. yeah, just, it's just, as well. yeah, yeah, very That's naive. Thing. Um, That's thing. Yeah. yeah, yeah. They were probably told um, like the, the, what their mission was, and it, they, maybe they were kind of deceived. Probably like they probably didn't know it was that dangerous. Mm. You can imagine that used to happen. Well, yeah. well there was a saying: they say if you forget history, you're doomed to repeat it. Yeah, hopefully we don't forget. So good, it's good that you're filming and you know mm -hmm. um, telling people about this. And so so we don't so we don't repeat it.
wish upon a sea Enough for me Carelessly ride Enough for free I will be traveling into Poland and Germany next, countries where many of the world's greatest atrocities took place. And because of war music, I will be armed with a new sense of how real this war was, how real the people affected were, how real the soldiers who died were. What first strikes me when I arrive at this factory is a feeling of sadness. Walking into Oskar Schindler's office, I feel the presence of a man who took it upon himself to try to save thousands of Jewish people from sure death. Stories are told of how he would change the minds of the Gestapo with bribes of money and liquor. Many times he was arrested on suspicion of trying to guard Jews from the German Reich. Yet even after these threats, he continued to try to save as many people as he could, including women, children, and the disabled. Some of his factories produced weapons that were ultimately unusable, generating him no profit. Upon his death, Oskar Schindler was bankrupt. His hospital costs were paid for by social welfare. The 1,200 Jews that Schindler saved were truly amongst the lucky ones. Jews, gypsies, Homosexuals and anyone else the Germans found ethnically impure were transported to concentration camps throughout Poland and Germany. Many of these selected outcasts were forced to take this journey from Krakow to Auschwitz. The original town's name was Auschwitzim, but the Germans couldn't pronounce that, so they changed the town's name to Auschwitz. There is an odd feeling in the air. The town is grey. This is one of the three main parts of the Auschwitz concentration camp. Over this entrance are the words Arbeit macht frei, work makes freedom. The Polish built these barracks before the war. The Germans took them over and initially used them to hold Polish political prisoners, but later held any prisoners they needed to. Prisoners who arrived at the camp had their possessions taken from them. Their heads were shaved and photographs of each of them were taken. Those who rebelled or broke the rules were taken here. The dark cells were very small and had no windows. Prisoners would slowly suffocate after using up all the oxygen in the room. Sometimes the SS guards would light candles to use up the oxygen more quickly. There were standing cells. After crawling in the cell through a small door, four or five prisoners would have no choice but to stand all night. They were still made to work during the day. Prisoners who were to be executed were brought here. They were forced to get on their knees, naked, before a single bullet was administered to the back of the head. The really unfortunate prisoners were used in medical experiments. German scientists used prisoners as guinea pigs, giving them diseases like malaria before trying to find a cure. They used x-rays and chemicals on women in hopes of finding new methods of mass sterilization. This part of Auschwitz was designed specifically as a death camp. When trains full of prisoners entered the camp, the SS doctors would decide who was fit enough to work while the rest were sent straight to the gas chambers. The prisoners built the buildings in which they lived. They slept five or six to a bunk. The prisoners were allowed access to the dirty and overcrowded toilets twice a day. In order to keep working, the prisoners were fed. They were given meager amounts of bread, soup, and coffee. This was their food for the entire day. Only one of the gas chambers remains intact. Prisoners were forced to strip naked outside and then marched into the building. Thousands of people have walked in here to never return. 
prisoners were brought into this room where Cyclone B was poured through the roof. Once exposed to air, Cyclone B released gaseous hydrogen cyanide. Killing would last only a few minutes. The bodies would be moved to the next room where they would be burned one by one. Empty cans of Cyclone B are on display. I keep asking the question why, but I am afraid there is no answer. Tear them up after you build them down. These walls of spirit to the ground. Listens on from the first wall. A building here from the floor I'm on my knees with my best friend She listens now but she's almost dead And now I feel the metal in The sight that cursed to find a friend I'm right now here beside your hands I'm cursing more than I ever planned The sun doesn't shine, the sea doesn't bring The warm and air from front of me I feel the bombs along the shore they tore down bridges, they tore down walls And now I fear that I am next But who gives a damn when you got nothing left? Supports this man who often prays of spirits coming from their graves. I did not care, no, I did not vote, but my parents should have left me run. I was just scared, just scared to say that right here at home it will be a grave, and all my friends. Yes, they went to fight My God, don't they know that they're off to die Many of the Nazi party leaders lived in this part of Germany. When Hitler was in power, you had to be a Nazi to live here. This was one of Hitler's favorite towns, and I can see why. It's beautiful. While having lunch in Berchtesgaden, I look up and see Hitler's eagle's nest. It is situated over 1,800 meters in the air. The eagle's nest would cost nearly $300 million to build today. It was completed in only 13 months and was Hitler's official 50th birthday present from the Nazi party. To get into the eagle's nest, you must take a brass-plated elevator straight into the building. Hitler only used this building a handful of times and for no longer than 30 minutes each time. Hitler used the eagle's nest to entertain dignitaries. After the war, the building was converted into a restaurant and has since then become a very popular tourist attraction. The red marble from the fireplace in the main dining hall was a gift from Mussolini to Hitler. 
From the eagle's nest, you can see the German Alps and the brilliant lakes nestled between the mountains. The eagle's nest is truly a phenomenal feat of engineering. But after visiting it, I can't help but feel nauseous. The cost of the building was not in millions of dollars, but in millions of lives. My God, there's no way for us to say things for what we did. Oh man, that just gives you such a nasty fucking feeling. There's nothing you can do about it. The history's gone, the history's over, it's done with. So I apologize, but I have yeah, to. I have okay. to. Emma filming. Yeah, no, I'm is famous. Oh, ooh. Ooh, is that are you filming? Of course. But where's the light? Exactly. Why are you so mean? I met Melanie while studying in Scotland. Melanie and Michael were both born and raised in Germany. With their help, I hope to better understand the war from the German perspective, and to find out how the German people have been able to move forward past the Nazi era. Look at this. It's all mine. <laughs> Do most uh, most Germans have their own castles then? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Almost, so almost every German has one or two castles at least. Do you talk to your camera when you're on your own and you're filming? Sometimes. <laughs> Why? What do you tell it? <laughs> Whatever it needs to know. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Nuremberg was the center of the large Nazi party rallies. This building was designed to hold some of those rallies, but it was never finished. We go to the Zeppelin Tribune, where many of the large Nazi party rallies were held. Hitler stood at this podium to talk to thousands of supporters. This area is now used for concerts and car races. I wonder how I would feel had I been born here. Would I have difficulty showing these buildings to visitors and explaining their history? Would I be happy that they've been turned into American fast food joints? Munich was the birthplace of the Nazis. Many of the first Nazi party rallies took place here. It is still difficult to escape the Nazi presence. On this wall, you can make out the outline of a swastika. On this art gallery that Hitler built, because he was such a lover of the arts, you can see the artistic motifs are based around the swastika. On the side of Munich University, you can see the bullet holes that remain from the war. 
This building is where the Scholl siblings, Hans and Sophie Scholl, passively resisted the Nazi regime. After authoring and handing out literature at this university that they attended, the Scholl siblings were sentenced to death and executed for their opposition to the Nazi movement. They were both about my age when they were killed. Later that night, we watched a recently made German film called Sophie Scholl, The Final Days. After the film, I asked Melanie and Michael what they thought and what they felt. Well, I think it's hard for uh, Germans to deal with their history because they don't want it to be their history. So this is the same problem with this national identity. So uh, or as a German, when you go to other countries, it's always a... Uh, well, they don't say, well, I'm German, I'm from Germany. It's still a problem for some people because of the history. Well, people from, from other countries say, oh, it's German. Well, and when you watch a, a film like that, you see they were sentenced to death for saying the truth. Well, they, they were Germans as well, so not all of the Germans were bad uh, or following Hitler. Okay, that's the history, that's the past. We're a different generation and we also want to move on, like other yep. people do. But also, um, people abroad have, as well, you know, have to accept that we are no Nazis anymore and during the the football World Cup in Germany 2006, it was just so much fun to have your little flag and support your your team and it was so much fun just to run around and say oh I'm German and we just won and that that was that was just fun and everybody had fun doing it we moved just a very very slow towards a, a new confidence about ourselves yeah. we head to Leupold's Grün, melanie's hometown we are at her parents beautiful mm -hmm. house <laughs> the next afternoon we have some lunch with her grandparents Michael kindly tells Melanie's grandmother that I would like some schnapps. David, drink your schnapps. Thanks, thanks, Michael. Prost. Prost. Yeah, yeah that's cool. <laughs> mm. By chance, he said, first I would like to see you. Despite what she says, I was always there for her. You got to let him wait. After lunch, Michael says that he wants to show me something in the town. So 
And you said you, who your grandfather's name is on that memorial? Yes, of course, because he died in the uh, Second World War. His name is on it. They are all names from the dead soldiers on it that lived in Lovefoot's Queen. Did you count them? No. Have you? No. There are a lot of names, though. Yeah. It was a long walk. Yeah. You have the keys. Yeah. How often do you come back here? We will be back in two weeks. <laughs> in two weeks, I hope. <laughs> My time with Melanie and Michael feels like it's gone by too quickly. They have to leave, but I will be spending one more night with Melanie's parents before the very last leg of my journey. Don't do that. <laughs> and be nice to my parents. Mm -hmm. And, hello. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Cheers. The next morning, Melanie's grandmother visits me to give me a box of chocolates and five euros to buy some beer in Berlin. Melanie's parents then take me to the train station and make sure that I have a good seat as they see me off. My final stop is a fitting one. This is where Hitler killed himself. His body was burned here, on this land, to prevent the Russians from finding it. A Holocaust memorial rests across the street. I can't help but find this ending anticlimactic. Here was a man who caused so much destruction and killed so many millions of people, but in such a cowardly way, ended his life. I think back to the cemeteries I saw and the battlefields I visited. I think of the hardships young soldiers faced, and I see that this war is still as strange to me as it was before I left. It doesn't make sense why a single man was able to convince thousands of educated, intelligent people to inflict immense pain and torment on so many. It doesn't make sense why 50 million people were killed I may not understand the reasons for war, and I may never understand. But after this journey, I do know that war isn't ultimately about ideologies or about political values. It's about Jim Tuckwell and Bill Ross. It's about Marie and Melanie and both their families. It's about challenging authority and inspiring change. It's about struggling to find a new identity. And because war is about these things, War never truly ends. It lives on in the memories, generation after generation. It lives on in the mistakes we continue to make. It lives on as we mourn so many who died and so many whose lives were devastated. It lives on as we move on. It's coming to an end But the people, yeah, they're screaming fight Cause, yeah, they're still alive I must always, yeah, remember how I felt When I looked to the wall With its colors, yeah, and it's over I was learning something now
pas supporter Tous les gens qui nous prennent pour des objets Quand on est bonne, on a à lutter Contre les obsédés qui pensent qu'à baiser C'est pas facile d'être bonne Mais moi c'est pas mon problème, je suis la déconne Je suis la déconne. 